Uh, so my name's Bryce. I'm the, the program chair here, and, and I'm on the C++ standards uh, committee. And we're going to talk about C++17. Uh, I, my, my catchphrase for this talk is it's, it's an introduction to C++17 via inspiring examples. You guys will have to tell me whether you find the examples inspiring. I do, but it's just me. Um, so a lot of people uh, worked with me on uh, this slide deck or um, developed similar material, which I then stole. It's all of these people right here. And there are links there if you want to go and look at all of their resources. Um, there's a lot of good material that's, that's been put out there about C++17. Uh, I, see, I see Tony is, is, is in the back there. He, in particular, is, is, uh, is, is responsible for a good chunk of this. Uh, so the first time I gave this talk, it covered like 32 features and like 100 slides and took like an hour and a half. And uh, now we've got, we've got 24 things I want to talk about here, uh, which is down from 26 as it was last night. Uh, and we'll see how many we get through. If we, I'm pretty confident we can at least get through all the language features and all the major library features. So it won't be a problem if we don't like get to the end. But but we're going to get there. We may this this session's probably not ending on time. Um, yeah. So I'm just going to sort of dive right in. So let's start off with the destructuring problem. So how do we assign convenient names to the components of an object? So like, for example, if I have some point 3D class and I want to use it somewhere where I just want to like, I don't want to do p.x and p.y and p.z everywhere. I just want to get some local names for the components here. Well, we don't, we don't really have a, a good way to do this today. Uh, and there's a bunch of different uh, dimensions to this problem. Like you might, you might want those to have a value semantics or a reference semantics. Um, and there is one facility you can use for this somewhat. So in C++, before C++17, we had this thing stood tie that works with tuple. So if, you, if instead of using my own struct, I wanted to put it into a tuple, I could go ahead and do stood tie of, of uh, some variable of this tuple, and then get, it would act as if it was binding to these names. There's a number of problems with this, uh, because the variable names need to be separately declared before they are bound. So like, oops, you could do something like this, and you won't really get a, a warning for this even though you've written the name twice here. That's sort of annoying. Um, there's other problems, like if you want to have it by, by uh, reference here, um, that's not really doable because you, you need to have these names need to be introduced and default initialized before uh, they are uh, tied to. And uh, again, like a, with const, same problem. In general, this, this pattern doesn't work well when you're trying to destructure into types that aren't default constructible. Um, and the, even types that might be default constructible, if, they're, if redundant initialization might be expensive, could be annoying. So also, it doesn't work with like your types. Doesn't work with things like std array, which it should. It's kind of annoying. So C++17, we have this feature called structured bindings, and what it does is it takes objects like my point 3D or tuples and arrays, and it destructures them into a bunch of components. So the, the syntax is like this: you have auto and the uh, I'll talk, I'll talk about the, that, that part in, in a moment. But you've got a list of names here. And then you have the object. And the object must be destructurable. And uh, that, that means that it's sort of intuitive. It, it needs to be something where it's, it's uh, sort of struct-like. So um, it either has to be all non-static data members uh, that must be public, must be direct members of the type, or members of the same public uh, base class of the type. They can't be unions. Or if you want to adapt some existing type, uh, you can write uh, customization, you can write uh, specializations of these customization points to make pretty much any type work with structured bindings. So the, the destructurable types in the standard library, some of the more useful ones, std array, std tuple, std pair. And the auto here, so you, you, you do need to use auto here or some form of auto, but it, it uses the regular auto deduction rules. So you can put like auto ampersand, auto ampersand, ampersand, auto. Uh, I don't think you can do, do any of the pointers in Texas. That wouldn't make any sense. Uh, and, and likewise for const files, I acquire files. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with this. So like it makes uh, dealing with uh, maps a bit easier. So like here I've got this for loop, and uh, I'm a range-based for loop over this map. And in the initializer here, I'm using a structured binding to take the pair of the map and go into a key value. Yeah. Um. You, the, 
don't think so. Um, not, not, not in the way that you're thinking of. Um, if you engineered it properly so that the auto deduction like uh, uh, works that way, then yes. But I, I don't, I don't, I can't actually think of a way how I would do that. Um, more, yes, you can put const in front of it. Um, it's more or less that. I don't want to get too far into how it actually functions. Um, but the, sh the short answer is I don't think that you can do exactly what you want. Um, it does sort of need to be something that's going to be uniform and applied to all the types. Um, yeah, so this is useful when you're dealing with maps because like map gives you back this pair of key values. That's kind of annoying. You just want to get a key and a value. So that's pretty nice. And so this brings us to our next C++ 17 feature. A number of these features are features that make dealing with maps, maps really nice. Um, I swear we did not just design C++ 17 to make std map easier to use, though. All right, so like, let's say that I've got like this find and update function here, where I want to, I want to, you know, go find this key, and if, if it's there, I want to go and go and update it, right? So it's kind of annoying that this uh, this iterator here has to live in this outer scope because I need it in the condition here. Right, that I'm only accessing this variable it in this scope here. Uh, but I, I do need it for the condition, so I have to put it in the outer scope. So this isn't just, it's not just ugly, but, but as I'll show you in a moment, there's some cases where it's just like really ugly and can be really annoying and can lead you to write bad code. So in C17, we've made if and switch work just like um, for loops, where they can take an initializer. So here, instead of having this in, uh, declaration of this variable here, I can put it. Uh, before the condition in the if loop, and then a semicolon, and then the condition, and then this variable will be in scope in, in the this uh, uh, in the if branch in, in the if statements uh, block scope. So it, it basically it, it's like this to this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so this is selection statements with initial with initializers. And my apologies for that. I didn't want to try to play around with the projector. Five minutes before the talk. Uh, yeah, so it's this goes to this. Pretty straightforward. It's, I, I, I don't want to say think of it as if it's just a macro mapping here, but it's more or less that. Um, so what, the scoping of variables when you have like if and, and else if, it, it takes a little, it takes a moment to think about it. But basically, the, whenever you have one of these initializers, it's in scope in the all of the um, possible um, blocks that could be taken after the initializer. So like here, x is introduced in, in this if statement. It's in scope here, here, and here. Y is here, so it's, not, it's obviously not in scope right here, but it's in scope here and in here. All right. So like, let's say that I'm implementing some string pool class. So yeah. Could I reuse x instead of y? Uh, I, oof, I don't know. Um, I think, I don't know. You would probably get a shadowing warning. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. You. I don't think you would get an error. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, ooh, that's a that's a tough one. All right, so let's say I'm implementing some string pool class. So the idea here is I want this class where it's going gonna, it's gonna to cache my strings after I'm done with them and then give them out to other people who need strings so that I can avoid having to go to the system allocator so I can just keep, keep my memory local. I don't have to go and call, call into the OS and make more allocations. And I want this to work between multiple threads, right? OK, so uh, I'm just going to talk about this one function here, pop. And the idea here with pop is I'm going to tell pop, hey, I'd like to get a string with like this capacity. Uh, either find me one, or if you don't have one, then go ahead and like allocate one. So it might look something like this. So I, I have some string variable here, then I enter this critical section where I go and check if the pool is empty. And if it's empty, I go ahead and take the back, the back element. Pretty straightforward, right? But th there's a problem here. So the problem is that the, I have this one if, if branch here for if I can find something in the pool. That's the actual critical section is this right here. Uh, but then I have this other part right here where I'm actually doing the capacity, and this will both handle if the one that I got was the wrong capacity, and if I didn't get one and I need to create a string that has the right capacity. 
um, but I'm still holding this lock right here, and this is not a this is not a critical section. So before C plus plus seventeen, you'd need to do something like this: put more braces in your code to to make this correct. I don't I don't need more braces in my life, so you could also just do this with C plus plus seventeen. So this is this is like my favorite thing to do with the if initializers. I think they're really nice when you're working with uh, lock guards, where the first thing you need to do in your critical section is check a condition, which is pretty common pattern. And as I said, they're, they're useful with maps. They are useful with maps. So this is here, like I'm, I'm doing this map dot in place um, on this key with this value. I get back the key value, uh, or here I, I'm getting back an iterator uh, bool pair, and I can just destructure it in the initializer here. In this case here is if the uh, insertion failed, and then I can do some error thing and maybe like report uh, what key was already in there. And then in the other case, I can go and do some, some callback function on the inserted element. All right, there's also the, the switch uh, init. It basically works the same way. I'm not going to show you any, any example for that. There's, there's some in, that I'll put in the slide deck afterwards, but it's the same basic idea. All right, we're going to talk about another C++ extension to if. So let's say that we're writing a variadic print function like this. So before C++ 17, the way that you would implement this uh, is that you'd write like some base case overload, and then you'd write some recursive version here that goes and picks off the first element of the pack, then processes it, and goes and, and processes the rest of them. Pretty straightforward. All right, so then in C++ 17, we can just use this new feature called if const expert to write this in one signature. So what we do here is we just we we have just this same signature here, and we do the the printing out of the first element, and then we do the recursion here with this if const expert. And what this does is when it when this condition is false, it, this statement here is not instantiated, and so the recursion stops, and it's all good. Otherwise. It would just like infinitely, it would infinitely recurse on, on the uh, uh, parameter pack size. You would, you would eventually need the termination case here. So this is, this is if const experts compile time conditional statements. So the condition must be a const expert expression, of course. And the rule is that the, the statement, each statement is discarded if their branch is not taken. And discarded statements can use variables that are declared but not defined. And discarded statements and templates are not instantiated. All right, pretty straightforward. So, oops. Uh, yeah. So, so, so as I said, when when if const expert here is false, the this statement is not instantiated. Recursive, the recursion stops there. Uh, so, there's a number of places where this is useful. Um, if you're writing, there's some Sphene cases where you can replace Sphene with this. Um, so, like if I'm implementing make unique here. Uh, before C++ 17, I need, I need to handle two cases. The, the first case is the case where the, um, the, the T is constructible from the arguments here, and I can detect that with this trait. And in that case, I want to do T parentheses, the arguments. I want to, I want to construct, do a functional style cast construct it. But if it's not constructible, so this case here, then I want to do unicorn initialization, so with uh, squiggly braces, right? So in C++ 17, you can just write this like this. So just one template here with an if const expert in the condition. It's quite nice. You don't have to write the condition twice, and you don't actually have to use Sphene. So another slightly more advanced example. Uh, no pun intended. So if it, tag dispatching. So if you were to implement an algorithm like advance, um, you could use Sphene, or another approach you could use is Tag dispatching here. So what tag dispatching is is that I, I'm creating some some type here within the template, or and I'm creating an instantiation of of, an, of a value of that type uh, that depends on one of these parameters here. In this case, the iterator category. And then I call some other uh, template function which takes another parameter and which is overloaded so that it has multiple implementations and and it will dispatch the correct implementation depending on this dependent type that we've instantiated here. This is a pretty common idiom that's been used. Uh, in C++. Uh, so in C++17, we can just write it like this. Just one function. We don't need, need any impl function, no tag. Well, we, you still need a tag here, but it's much cleaner. All right, another one here. So this is, this is probably my favorite one. So let's say I've got some, some person uh, struct here. 
uh, that has some, some uh, you know, getter interface here. And I, I want to adapt this to work with structured bindings, but I can't modify the struct. So I need to, use, I need to write the uh, free git template function. I can't write the member git template function or do anything particularly fancy. Um, so before C++17, you might, this might be one way that you'd write it. So you'd, you'd declare the function here, and then you'd do full specialization, right, for each one of the cases here, and then you'd get a compile error if you were out of bounds. C++17, you can just write this. So just write it with if const expert. Now, you, you might be wondering here, well, what about the out of bounds case? Well, in the out of bounds case here, you, none of these branches are taken, and auto gets deduced as void. And then it's trying to instantiate void reference, which you can't do, and so you'd get a compilation error. So I think that's pretty cool. All right. Um, yep. Uh, does it do the more some void function, not returning something, where you wouldn't deduce it from the missing return type? Could I have add, uh, an else with an, uh, a static assertion false? A static assertion false. <laughs> um, yeah, and it, it, that was never, that was not taken? Uh, a static assertion. It me if I were to like do that. Um, I believe that I believe that yeah that, that if you have a static assert in the else branch that's not taken, um, that you'll be fine. Um, yeah, it, it would have to be a template function, of course. Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you you'd need to have the else. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So next up. So this, this is fold expressions. So let's say that we're writing a variadic function where we want to sum up all of the arguments, all the input arguments here, so something like this. So writing this before C++17 would sort of look like something I've shown you guys before, right? So you need some base cases. You need a recursive case here. You, you need two base cases here because you need to handle both the initial value case and the, and the single element case. So, because you need to both terminate recursion, and you need to handle handle the, the case where you have uh, where you call it with just with just nothing. So in C plus plus seventeen, you can just write it like this. So ns plus dot 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 plus zero. So this is a uh, fold expression. So it's a new way to work with with parameter packs. So fold expressions apply binary operators to parameter packs. There are four types of fold expressions here. They differ in the order in which the binary operator is applied, and whether they take an explicit initial value. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple slides. The parentheses around the fold expression are required uh, for parsing reasons. Um, and all binary operators are foldable. So this is, a, uh, this is a binary right fold over the plus operator. So what, it, what this means is we've provided a central, an explicit sentinel value, 0. And the operator is applied from, from right to left. So it does 17 plus 0 here, and then it does the result of that plus negative 42, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, a Boolean AND function is a good example of a, a unary left fold. Um, so it folds over the, uh, the ampersand ampersand operator here. And so we want to we do the opposite order here because we, we wanted to short circuit properly. Um, but notice, we, like, we don't have any sentinel value here. So what happens if I call it with nothing? Like, what does it do? What does it return? So it, it needs to return a bool, obviously. But does it return true? Does it return false? Well, for, for these operators, um, you can use them with, with unary folds. So uh, uh, Boolean AND, Boolean OR, and the comma operator. And uh, it will be assumed that the sentinel value is is these, these values on the right here. And for any of any operators not listed there, you can't use that type of fold expression. So here's, here's another cool one that I like, which is a print function here. So this is a binary left fold over the left shift operator. The initial value is std c out. Then I'm folding over the shift operator here. And then I've got my argument here. And then the, at the end, and that's all in the parentheses. So this all here is the fold expression. And then at the end here, I'm just putting out a new line. And then this, this one is pretty cool, too, I think. So this is a fold expression for where I've got uh, a function here, and I want to apply it to each one of the arguments of this parameter pack individually. So I've got this function call here. And what this is, is this is a 
unary right fold over the comma operator. And so each one of those returns a void, so, that, so it doesn't actually produce a, a value. But I like this one in particular. All right, so next up is class template deduction. Um, so before C17, we, you know, we've obviously we've had template uh, function template deduction to simplify the usage of function templates by allowing us to omit explicit template parameters when they can be deduced by the compiler from the function's arguments. We haven't had that sort of deduction for class templates, which can be annoying. Something like tuple um, or pair, uh, especially when you're writing it with a like functional style cast, it can be, get to be very verbose. And so we have facilities like make tuple and make pair to help simplify this, and which go and use. Uh, function template deduction. In C17, we've introduced class template deduction. So now it is possible to, for your uh, class template parameters to be deduced from declarations, functional style casts, and one other thing that I'll show you in the next slide. So here it's just std tuple and then t, and it'll deduce it from the, the arguments to the, to the uh, constructor here. And then in the functional style cast, it would also work. And uh, it can also be deduced from a new expression. Um, so I don't know why you would uh, want to new a, a tuple like this, but this was just the simplest example I could think of. So bear with me. So you, previously, you would need to explicitly write the types out. Now you can, they can be deduced in a new expression. And so this is, this is really useful in a number of places, like lock guard. This, this makes the ray pattern a lot easier. right? You go from, from having to write like this, where you write the mutex type, you're just saying, like, hey, lock me that mutex. So as I said, there's, there's three, three uh, things from which uh, class template deduction can, can occur. So de declarations, functional style expressions, and new expressions. It is only performed if no template arguments are provided. So you cannot, well, unlike with, with uh, uh, func template function deduction, you cannot specify some of the parameters and have some of them deduced. If you specify, like for here, if you do std tuple int and you've got like t01, this will not work. You need to either provide all of them or none of them. So there is, so, so there's some cases where class template deduction doesn't work as you may wish. So a facility has been added uh, called uh, user defined deduction guides that um, allows you to control how class template deduction operates. Um, so the, the syntax, and I'll show you in another slide, this is the syntax best understood through examples, but it, it's you write the template name and then a list of parameters and you could put a template beforehand to declare the parameters. Um, and then you write what uh, what it should map to, what instantiation it should map to. Um, so these don't have to be templates, but, but they can be. And they must be within the same scope, so namespace or enclosing class as the class template. So for, for example, vector. So std vector has in C17 a deduction guide for its um, constructor that takes two iterators. Because if, like, consider this case right here. I've got this vector, and I've given it two iterators. And, and I, I've not given it any template arguments, so I need to deduce it here. Well, the compiler doesn't, doesn't know like, what, what, what we mean here. right? What we actually mean is, hey, figure out what the value type of that iterator is, and then that's the type of vector that you are. And so that's what this deduction guide does. Is it says, hey, when you've got you know, this, when you have this constructor that takes two iterators, go ahead and, and you're a vector of the, the iterator traits of one of those iterators. Obviously, uh, 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 there's probably a SVNA condition to make sure that those things are actually iterators. All right, and so as I said, they don't have to be deduction guides. Don't have to be templates. So, like, if I have some name class here, take the first and the last name, and then it's it's instantiated for some string representation, I could just have a deduction guide like this that says that C style uh, uh, char const stars should be uh, std string views. And if you don't know what string view is, don't worry. We're going to get to that. Um, so like here, if I do this name in with these two uh, uh, string literals, this will become a name string view. But if I give it in here two std strings, it'll just become a name std string. All right. So next up, we're going to talk about another sort of deduction-ish feature. So auto non-type template parameters is the best formal-ish name we've come up with. But I like to think I like to call the feature template auto. So before C++ 17, obviously it stood integral constant, which is basically what I have on this slide here. Uh, it's one of our fundamental metaprogramming primitives. We use it to express compile time values. 
So you write like, you know, hey, I, I want to, I have this int constant here, or I have a char or whatever, and this is how we do a lot of our metaprogramming. Uh, but this is kind of verbose. Um, like modern C++, we expect to have the capability to, to express a value and have its type be deduced. So in C++ 17, you can now have auto as a template parameter, and auto indicates a non-type template parameter that is deduced, not a type template parameter. So like here, that's my constant. Now it just takes one parameter. And so now I don't have to write the types. And if I'm passing it in like something like a function or, or even a lambda, I don't have to write it twice, which is really convenient. I can just write it once, it'll be deduced. So template auto uses the regular auto deduction rules. Um, so auto, const, auto, ampersand, combinations of those, auto star, et cetera. Um, now, one thing to note is that it is heterogeneous. So it, it, it can be variadic. So like if I'm writing a sequence here, I can do auto dot 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 of the elements of the sequence. And this is very cool. This sort of gives us a capability we didn't previously had. So like this, the integer sequence that we're familiar with in the standard library, it just really works like one type of, one, one class of types. But now we can write uh, a more general sequence that will work with heterogeneous types, sort of a compile time tuple sort of thing here. Like this last one here, it's a sequence of int, car, and bool. Uh, you cannot. Um, yeah, I, it's something that I've also wanted, but unfortunately, no. So, uh, the, the the question was the, the the sorry the question I just answered was uh, before that one was uh, was uh, do they all can you put types in there and no they all have to be non types and then your question was uh, do they have to be built in types the answer is no they have to be anything. That uh, meets the that that can be a, a uh, non-type template parameter. Um, so I don't have the list offhand, but um, types that are literal types um, or, or, or trivial that are sort of trivialish types. So like tag types would work. Um, I, I'm I'm hesitant to 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 try to list the requirements off the top of my head, but there it's not it's not limited to built-in types. It is limited to anything that you could pen. Okay. All right. Uh, so, so actually, here's an example of uh, where you might where you'd use it with a non-built-in type. So uh, a library that I work on has a, uh, a representation of, dimension, of a multi, multiple dimensions for a multi-dimensional array uh, where we want to be able to express both dynamic dimensions, so dimensions that we won't know until runtime, and static dimensions that we know at compile time. So previously, to make this work, we had to do hacks, like just pick a magic value like negative one, and use that as the indicator that this particular dimension, we're not going to know it until runtime. But now in C++17, I can just write a tag type here and get the same effect, but without having to uh, steal a value from, the, uh, from whatever the homogeneous type of my parameter pack is. So speaking of, of uh, metaprogramming um, and this particular example, I want to talk about another uh, uh, C++ 17 feature, inline variables. So uh, probably anybody who's done metaprogramming has seen a lot of this pattern where you, you, you need to put some context for values in your header-only libraries. In C++ 17, we've added support for inline variables that work like inline functions. So now you don't have to deal with all of the uh, baggage that comes with uh, uh, putting a, a global variable in a header. So let me show you, well, let me go to the synopsis. So, so variables can now be inline just like functions. They may be defined in more than one translation unit as long as the definitions are identical. The definitions must be present in a translation unit that accesses an inline variable. And an inline variable can have external linkage, uh, so like not static, and it, and it must be uh, declared inline, but it must be declared inline in every translation unit and has, and has, uh, this, it has to have the same address in every translation unit. A uh, static const expert member variable is implicitly inline in C++17. So like if I have this like extern stood atomic bool that I have in some header somewhere that indicates that some part of my system is ready, uh, before C++17 you had to uh, initialize it in the source file. Now you don't have to do that. You can just put it in the header and just leave it there. Same thing for if you have it as a, a static member, data member of a function. 
All right, so the next feature. So uh, uh, there's two sort of related features uh, that help make lambdas usable in context for context. So prior to C++17, you couldn't really use lambdas in context for functions. Uh, and you couldn't really use them in context per context. So like here, I've got this lambda here, and I'd like to, 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 to uh, call it to get some value for, for uh, this context per int i. I can't do that because the lambda's call operator is not context per. In C++17, you can mark it as context per, and then this works. But also, in C++17, the compiler just figures out if it can be context per or not. And so the const expert is optional. You can put it there if you'd like, but if the function would be const expert, the compiler will determine it. And so basically, this code will just work in C++17. But note that this makes this does not make the lambda itself const expert. This, this is the, the lambda call operator being const expert. So if you want to have a const expert lambda, that is now also supported. So a const expert lambda is different in that it it, it is, you can construct it in a context per context. You can copy it around because not only its call operator is context per, but also its, its uh, constructors and its assignment operators. Uh, so Louis Dion is one of the people who championed this feature because he, uh, he has a clever way of implementing uh, tuples storage using uh, context per lambdas. So the basic idea here is to uh, have a, a, a series of these uh, uh, context per lambdas and to, to capture uh, in the closure, uh, by value, each one of, the, of the, the tuple arguments. And then the storage is the closure itself. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a dot, dot, dot here, which I've actually never seen from him, but that's where he says it's, it's complicated, but can be implemented. But so he, this is a, uh, one of the, the things that you can do with context for lambdas now. So you can use them. They're, they're, they're usable now in context for context, where they weren't really prior to C17. All right, this is a very quick one. Static assert used to require you to give it two arguments, this first argument being the condition, second argument being a message. A lot of people have probably written code like this because they didn't want to write a message. Don't have to do that anymore. Now the second parameter is optional. That's all. Uh, so we're on guaranteed copy illusion now. So before C++17, pretty much every compiler implemented return value optimization. Uh, but it hasn't been required. And because it hasn't been required, this means that you can't write a factory function that relies on return value optimization for if the type that you're returning is non-movable. That, that even, even if the compiler is like, hey, I, I, I know I can RVO this, because it's not required, it needs to make sure that you actually have the constructor, so either a move or a copy constructor, that it would need if it couldn't RVO this. So this is no longer the case in C17. You can now have something like this, like a, like a grab lock function here that uh, returns a non-movable type like lock guard. Pretty cool feature. Uh, so return value optimization is now mandatory. You can RVO non-movable types. Named return value optim optimization and other forms of copy elision are not mandatory. All right, next feature, another quick one, nested namespaces. You can now declare ne namespaces nested like this. So the syntax on the left, equal to the right. Pretty straightforward. <sighs> Let me leave you guys here for a second. <clears throat> All right, next up. So this one is the last language feature we're going to talk about, which is good. We're doing pretty good on time, actually. So this is uh, the, a new feature called has include, underscore, underscore, has include. It is a preprocessor predicate for header testing. So you would use it in like a, a, in a uh, hash if or a hash else if, et cetera. Um, and what it does is it, uh, you give it a, 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 some header that you, you're thinking about including, and it tells you it's true if that, if that file exists, and it's false if that header can't be found. So this can be useful for looking for optional dependencies, or like looking for something that used to be in an experimental, uh, but now, since in, now is in C++17, so that you can, you can work with both C, with older C++ compilers and newer C++ compilers. So it's a pretty nifty little feature. And speaking of string view, let's talk about string view. All right, so let's say we're writing this, this function here, so this first three function. So it takes some string, and uh, it returns back the first three characters of the string. So if we write it this way, it's kind of not great because we're sort of we're forced to make a copy of this string here and to return a copy a copy of the of the substring, um, and even if like we're going to use it like here in this case like we're not we don't need a copy we're not modifying 
the, the um, return value here, right? It would be nice if we didn't have to make that copy. So in C++ 17, we have a thing called std string view, uh, which is a non-owning view into a string uh, that lets you do this. So if you were to just change these interfaces to take string views and return string views. Now, you don't have to make it take a string view here. You could just return a string view here. But you should, you should probably just take a string view in interfaces like this. Um, and so what it, what it will turn is a string view is sort of the moral equivalent of a pointer plus size. So it's going to be something that's cheap to copy. It's just like this non-owning view. And then we don't have this copy here that we had in this prior example. So it's, it's in this header uh, string view. It's a non-owning view of a string, as I said. The interface is mostly the same as std string. It has all of the, um, all of the find-ish functions, et cetera. Um, it is, I'm going to say, in a number of places in the standard library that take strings today, um, also now take string views, but not all places. But that is something that will be corrected over time. Um, so it doesn't ever allocate, doesn't ever new new things. It it doesn't own its contents. Uh, it's it's cheap, as I said. It pa you should pass it around by value because it's like a pointer plus a size. You're not allowed to modify the underlying elements of the string, though. One of the reasons for this is that if you have a string view that you construct from a uh, like a car const star, you would not want to modify the uh, the terminating character. That would be bad. That would lead to bugs in your code. So this is a a uh, sort of read-only view of uh, some type of string. So like here, I'm, this is using it with with regex implement a split function. So I want to like split up some string based on some token, and if I'm writing it with string, what I'm going to get back here is like a vector of strings. Like that's not great. I don't want to like create a bunch of new little strings. Uh, if you do it with string view, you get back a vector of string views. So a vector, a vector just views into the original input string that you gave it. That's nice. And so this is also useful for uh, simplifying your string-related interfaces. So like let's say I have this function to int. Its purpose is to take a string and to convert it into an int. So previously, maybe I had like interfaces that looked like this. I had like a std string constant, a card const star uh, API, and then like one for my string. Well, with this string view, you can just make that the interface type that you use. And then like you can make your string convertible to that, and whatever other third party strings you need to use can be just converted to that string view. It's not true for all, op for not all interfaces that you're going to implement that are going to use strings. But there's a lot of them where you just need a read-only view. So I want to sort of expand on this example a little bit. So, so this two in example here, like what do we do if, uh, if we have an error here? Like if we can't uh, convert the string to a integer. So there's a couple different options. So we could rever return a default constructed int on a parse error. Sounds like a great idea. Uh, we could throw on a parse there. We could return, like, like, sorry, that one should have an int there, and then like a bool, like an int by reference, and then a bool there, and return false on parse there. Uh, you could have like a unique pointer, and you could like go and allocate just just cause, and return a null when it, you don't have it. Uh, so all these options, I think, are are not not as elegant as you might want. Even throwing is not as elegant as you might want, as there's a lot of people who might be using your interfaces who would not want to get an error reported via an exception. So in C++ 17, we have a thing called std optional. What it is is it's a nullable object wrapper. And it's, it's a very convenient way to, uh, to report errors from these sorts of interfaces. So it's in this header, include optional. It's a nullable object wrapper. It, uh, it, it adds a null state to the value that it wraps. So it's sort of similar to this approach here, with the exception that it does not actually allocate memory. Yes, question. Yes, you can. Okay, and how do I distinguish between an empty string and non null string? Um, I'm not sure I can. I'm not, I, I, let me get back to you on that. I'm not sure that I'm going to give you the correct answer off the top of my head. Um, yeah, is anybody here now? Is Tony still here? Anybody? All right. 
I'll, I'll find the answer for, uh, to that for you later. OK, stood optional. So stood optional, it, it sort of looks and acts and feels like a smart pointer, but it does not actually allocate memory. It's, it just sort of has it in internal storage. I mean, it, it, if your type allocates memory, it will allocate memory. But it does not add another indirection of new allocation uh, to your type. Um, so it, it, it owns its contents. It's, it should be cheap to copy if T is cheap to copy. And uh, you should pass it. Like if you pass T by reference, you should pass this by reference. If you pass T by value, you should pass this by value. And now it's not just about error handling. It's, it's much more useful. Uh, so it's useful in a number of, of other contexts. Um, and I'll, I'll show you an example or two of that. But let me show you a little bit of how you'd use it. So here, like I just do a std optional int. And note, of course, this int here, uh, when, I, when I don't initialize an int like this, what do I get? Who knows? You could, you could, get, you could get anything. But for the std optional int, you know that it'll be default constructed here. So that you can, you can declare it without initializing it, and it'll be in a valid state. And then I go and I do my you know, horrible conversion mechanism of std string stream. And uh, then like if it, if it, I just check for if it's succeeded. And if it's succeeded, I assign to the optional. And otherwise, I just return the optional, which was uh, just declared here and is in the default null state. So it's also useful for if I wanted to add an uh, optional uh, member to a class. So like previously, prior to C17, a naive implementation of this might be like, if I'm implementing a person, and if like middle name, some people might not have a middle name, but some people we might not know that, the, that, that they have a, whether they have a middle name or not. So like we have incomplete data in our database. And, We'd like to be able to distinguish in between those. But this is kind of tricky if we're, if we're going to use this as our predicate for whether the middle name is known. So if it's, if it's empty or not, then we can't distinguish between people who, whose middle name we know and people who have, uh, who have an unknown, who, whose middle name we know and who it's in, it's a, they have no middle name, and people who we don't know whether they have a middle name or not. Sorry, that was. <laughs> Not, not well described at all. I butchered that. It's OK. So we could like add a bool to track this, this additional null state here. Um, but that's kind of not great, because like then, then you have these two things that have this invariant. It would be nice to encapsulate them. So I think std optional is a better approach there. And then you can, just, you can ask whether or not the std optional, so just it's, it's contextually convertible to bool, whether or not it's been filled in or not, distinct from whether or not the underlying thing, the string, is empty. And uh, another use case for this is for optional parameters. So like if I have this slice function here with a start and an end, and uh, like I want people to, to, to maybe provide one or, or, or both, but I'd be fine with people like providing. I, I want to have people to give people the option of, of uh, only defaulting one of these. And so I don't want to like pick one where you have to like specify both. So you could do this with std optional. And then with this, it has a method value or. And so what value or does is that if you can, if it has the value, if it's in the valid state and if it has a value, then it will give you back that value. And otherwise, it will return the value that you passed in into value or here. So like here, I've got like, I'm, I'm going to make a substring of some string here. And I do start with value or. So it'll be 0 if this was in the null state. And otherwise, it's going to be whatever that value was, et cetera. Yeah. You can also stood none function, like in boost optional. Uh, 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 in boost optional, you have the, the boost uh, colon colon none constant. Uh, is there also such a constant with the with the new standard? I don't I don't know the answer for sure, but I think the answer is sorry. The answer is yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah. So, so, so the question was whether there is a, an equivalent of boost. It's num. num of boost num, and the answer is that it's stood null opt. Yeah. All right. So next, this is we're going to talk about variant. Um, and I've got I've got I've got the variant champion in the audience, of course. All right. So before C plus plus seventeen, writing a discriminated union was not easy, and actually. Seven years ago, when I first came to this conference and talked on this stage, what I talked about was writing a, a discriminated union. 
So it's funny that I'd like come back full circle. Uh, but yeah, it's not a fun process. Like if you want to do it using like a union, uh, union is not great for this. You need to maintain the uh, the uh, the state, whatever, whatever state this thing is in, separately from the union. And so like that's very error prone. Like what if you you keep adding things here and like you miss one of them, and then like you're in trouble. And also uh, like union is not great with things that are not uh, built-in types. So if it's something with a with a a user-defined constructor and destructor, um, I think may maybe a non-trivial constructor and destructor, and you're, you you want to put it in a union, you basically need to use placement new and, and delete, and and uh, and explicitly call the destructor, uh, which is not super awesome. So in C plus plus seventeen, we have a really cool thing called sort variant, which is a discriminated union designed for C++ and not for C, and it's a really powerful feature. So it's in variant, so discriminated union, as I said. The interface is similar to boost variant. Um, the, there are distinctions from how std variant works and boost variant works. I don't want to really talk about those too much here. Um, access use, well, one of the common ways of accessing a variance value is through the visitor pattern. There are other ways of of uh, querying what state it's in and getting the value out, of course. Uh, so it, it doesn't do any heap allocations unless you know one of these objects that it contains does heap allocations. And it owns its contents. Whether you should pass it, whether you should, whether you should copy it or pass it would depend on whether or not the things you're putting into it are expensive or cheap. And also sort of depends on like what state it's in when you're passing it around. So. This is, this is sort of one of the lengthier example, examples here, but I'm, I'm going to show a couple examples of how you can access variants here. So I've got this multiplier visitor that works for, for strings and ints and uh, then a, a array of two ints. Um, and so using this std visit, I can give it uh, an instance of my function object here, and it will go and, and it'll call the correct overload for whatever state the object, the variant is currently in. All right, pretty straightforward. But it's kind of unfortunate that we have to have to like write a struct for this. It would be nice if we can do it in place. Well, we can. You can use if const expert and the the sort of tag dispatching idiom I showed you earlier to do this uh, with a lambda, with a generic lambda. So I I have my uh, generic lambda right here, and then inside of it I, I go and I figure out what type t is. And then I just have a bunch of if expers for all the different cases. It's kind of nifty. Uh, there's another thing that's uh, sort of a preview of a feature that's probably going to come in C++20, um, which is uh, there, I got this overloaded struct. What this thing does is basically you give it a bunch of lambdas, and then it uh, creates a function object that has the overload set of all those lambdas. And it uses a C++17 feature that's not covered by any of my slides, but you can now you can have a using declaration that uh, uh, takes a parameter that that ex expands a parameter pack. So you can have a using declaration where you say, "Hey, I want to use the call operator of all of my variadic base classes here." And so then you would use it like this. So I would write you know a bunch of lambdas, one for each case. And so then I can really sort of write the same pattern I had here. I'm just writing like an overload set wherever I'm doing the visitation. It's kind of nice. Uh, yeah. So you go to the previous slide, please. Yeah. With the if const expert. Yeah. Uh, we can't determine the type at compile time, right? If const expert is not a compile time evaluation line. It, um, I, so I'm not sure I understand the question. So the variance can be in any one of the three types there. We need to check the if at runtime to know which one is the valid type. Am I um, so the, it will instantiate this in, internally in the place where visit is implemented. It will have you know the, the, the each call to this, and at each call site of this generic lambda, it'll instantiate it with the correct type, and then there it will build sort of the, the, the right one in each place. Does that, does that make sense? So the, 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 uh, I'm going to have trouble repeating the question, so I think I'm going to uh, punt there. But it was sort of, how does this work? Um, <laughs> um, 
Oh, and I, I, I forgot to mention this uses another feature here. This is uh, uh, when you're using the class uh, template deduction uh, for aggregate types, you normally need a deduction guide. And this was just the quickest way to write, the shortest way to write this example here. So this uses like three or four C++ 17 features. Variants also useful for, for writing recursive data structures, for example, like a binary tree here. So like this is my, uh, uh, this is my bi binary tree. I've got like the branch here with left and right. And then I've got this std variant here for whether I'm a, a leaf or a branch. All right. So what if I need like a variant, but I don't know the types at compile time? Or if like I want to, I don't like a heterogeneous vector. Um, so we have this new facility in C++ uh, 17 that adds, it's a generalized type erasure facility called any. It's somewhat similar to like a, a, a runtime type erased variant, but it's probably not the greatest way to think about it. Um, it's, I like to think about it as just a generalized type erasure facility. And so you can use it to, to do something like this, a std vector of std any, I can just put whatever I want in there. It's like I can put a string, a tuple, 42, I could put another std vector of std any. Pretty cool. So it's in this header any. It's type erasure. The, the objects have to be copyable. Uh, there's four main operations you can do with any. You can copy it. You can assign a value of some type t. You can ask it whether it contains a value of some type t. And you can retrieve a value of some type t from it with this any cast thing, which will, which will throw an exception if you, uh, if you try to get a type out of it that, that it's not currently in that state. I don't believe there's a visitor uh, mechanism for it um, because I, 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 can't I, I can't really envision how that would, that would, that would uh, uh, look like. So it's, you normally want to, you need to sort of query it uh, uh, to, get, to get the state out of it. So um, it will return the type T. So it's a, it's a template member function that, that you have to explicitly say, hey, this is the type I want to get out of you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think we should, it would be nice to have something like that, um, I think. Uh, I kind of like the visitor pattern, but we don't, I don't think we have it right now um, in the standard. Um, and so stood in it, its type ratio, it will use, it will potentially allocate memory. Uh, it, it owns its, its contents. Um, uh, that one should be wrong, I should say. It's potentially expensive because it allocates memory. Uh, but it, it is sort of dependent on how expensive copying your underlying thing is. But it will always need to allocate a new any when you copy it. And you should probably pass it by reference. All right, so now I'm going to talk about my favorite C++ 17 feature, parallel algorithms. It's my favorite because I've been sort of involved in this uh, feature. So pre prior to C++ 17, we had some concurrency facilities, some threading facilities. But we haven't really had parallel programming facilities. So if you wanted to write something like just a, a parallel for loop that was also potentially vectorized, you'd have to use some other thing that's not part of the standard like OpenMP. So in C++17, uh, we have parallel algorithms. So instead of writing this, you could just write std for each, just like the for each that you know today, except that it has an additional parameter that you could pass at the beginning, which is uh, an execution policy. And so these two are roughly, roughly equivalent. Um, it's also like, if you want to do a parallel sort, hey, there's your parallel sort in C17. All right, so the, because algorithm, the, the, the algorithms live in both algorithm and numeric, and all the parallel overloads also live in both algorithm and numeric, the execution policies live in the execution header. Um, so, these new overloads, they take, as I said, this execution policy thing for most of the existing algorithms. And I'm going to explain what that is in the next slide. For now, I'm going to talk about some of the other uh, places where, they, where the parallel algorithms differ from their non-parallel overloads. So the input iterator, uh, any place where there's an input iterator requirement uh, in the parallel algorithms, it's been strengthened to forward iterator. Um, and same for, for, same for output iterator, I believe. Um, the complexity guarantees are relaxed for some algorithms. Uh, there's a, both a general relaxation from any place where there's a, a complexity guarantee that is exact in the serial algorithms. We now say it's O of that exact uh, guarantee. And there's also some other places where we further relaxed complexity guarantees where we 
did not because we, we knew that there was not a parallel implementation that could meet that complexity guarantee. We also, yeah, question, yeah. The, the question was, what are the restrictions on how the, on the implementation of a backend? Let's, let, me, let me cover that on the next slide. Um, but the short answer is, uh, there are restrictions, but they're sort of very, they're very general. That's a feature that's coming down the road. But let me, I'll, I'm going to cover that in just a moment. Um, so there's new algorithms that are designed for parallel programming. Uh, so reduced inclusive scan and exclusive scan are based on existing numeric algorithms, but they have weaker uh, ordering guarantees. Um, and then we have transform reduced, transform inclusive scan, and transform exclusive scan, which are uh, combined algorithms. So transform reduce does a transformation and then feeds a pseudo sequence to a, a reduction. Uh, it's it's sort of like a more generalized uh, map reduce. Um, and yeah, let's get into what the execution policy are. So the execution policy describes the how of execution. So whether or not parallelism is allowed and sort of what type of restrictions must be respected by the underlying implementation. So how can you parallelize this? How can you screw around with my code while parallelizing it? Um, and that's all that's in C++ 17. Um, so it does not have, give you a way to specify where parallelism happens. That is coming in C++ 20. So executors are the thing that, uh, that would describe where execution happens. So on a thread pool, current thread, GPU, et cetera. It's a feature that's in the pipeline. It's not in 17. Should be there in 20. Um, so there's three execution policies in 17. Uh, stood seek, stood par, stood par, and seek. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm going to avoid reading you the formal definitions because I was thinking to myself as making as I was making this slide deck. That's not useful to anybody but me. Uh, I, I just like like it doesn't have a lot of value. I'm just going to tell you like what the TLDR is because um, I think that's that's better. If you want to look them up though, they're in the notes for the slide. Uh, so std seek is just going to be serial execution. Now you might wonder why would you use this and not use just the non-parallel overload? Well, the there as I mentioned on this slide, there's some differences between how the parallel version, the serial, and the, the non-parallel versions would work. Std seek is a useful debugging tool because it won't give you parallel execution, but it would go through the same machinery. Also, the error handling is different for, for the uh, uh, serial algorithms and the uh, parallel algorithms. Basically, for the parallel algorithms, uh, if a uncaught exception escapes from uh, one of your user, fu a function that you wrote, if, if you threw an exception and it escaped from there into the parallel algorithms machinery, std terminate gets called. Um, I am, I, and if you hate that, I am definitely the person to blame, and I am both sorry and not sorry at the same time. <laughs> so std par, std par is most closely matches the SMPTE model. So parallelism, but not vectorization, because in SMPTE the vectorization is done by the hardware. So it, so what what this guarantees you is that the uh, comp there won't be anything that goes and tries to interleave your functions, and that the operations will be sequenced with respect to each other on each thread. This is basically like normal C++ rules. Like it, the, the things that you would normally expect like C++ to do and compilers to do. std par on seek gives the compiler permission to do weird things that, you, that the compiler can't do today. In particular, it could, like if for for each, it could go and say, hey, I'm going to interleave uh, multiple different invocations of the, uh, f of the function that you've passed into for each. Um, and interleave the, the execution of the individual steps of those functions. So it allows, it allows and gives permission for vectorization by the compiler. Um, and it, it's a better match for, it, it, it works for, for the SMD model, it works for the, for the uh, it's a better match for the SMD model in particular, so like Intel GPUs. Um, it, I mean, it, it, which one you use, it should depend on what you're, uh, not, not on the hardware that you're targeting, it should depend on what is, what you can tolerate in your code. So don't, don't match these to uh, particular systems. Match these to what, uh, like, what can I allow here? Is interleaving it fine? Is it not fine? And pick the execution policy accordingly. Yeah, I see a question in the back. Right. Uh, so if I need to do a rank 
you're used to rank order reductions in MPI, what Um, yeah, so we should talk about that later. Um, the, yeah, I think, we, I think we'd have to talk about that later. I don't think that's an execution policy question. Uh, I, although, with that said, you would definitely not want to use par on seek or on seek, I think. Although, I, th I think the interleaving that you'd get on a SIMD architecture for, from like a vectorizing compiler would largely always be sort of a some ordering that's 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 uh, sort of something no, actually I take that back um, you you should use std par but I'm not certain that we have the algorithm that really gives you what you want std accumulate is uh, completely ordered but uh, we don't have a parallel version of it and std reduce is well, allows arbitrary reordering uh, you might be able to do it with one of the scans though so we should talk we should talk afterwards um, all right so some um, I'm going to now uh, talk about transform reduce briefly because I can't give a talk anymore without talking about transform reduce. It's my favorite function ever. So let's say that you want to do a dot product of two vectors uh, in C17. You can do that, and you can do it in parallel with transform reduce. It's awesome and amazing. So transform reduce is sort of like an inner product. Uh, it's a little more generalized than inner product, though. So uh, this, this is a version here that takes two sequences, the binary, binary transform reduce. So it takes, it takes two binary operators, a binary reduction, and a binary, uh, uh, a binary transformation. Uh, and, and for this overlook, yeah. Where are you getting the binary operation from? They, the, they default to plus and multiplies. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and so you can also write it, in, so I, I, all of the new algorithms, that the new parallel algorithms, they also have sequential forms. So like inner product, no, it's the other one that inner product doesn't have an overload for. But you can, if you just wanted to write like std transform, if you wanted to write this without the, without the execution policy, you can do that. All right, next one, like let's say you want to do a vector norm. So I've just got one input here, and I want to do a vector norm over it. So I want to do, so the, the, uh, transforma the, yeah, the transformation I want to do is multiply the element by itself, and then the reduction is addition. And then I've just got a square root on top of it. So this, this is because there's no functional, uh, there's no square function or square function object in the functional header. This one does not have defaulted uh, operations. Um, I'm sad about it, but may, maybe, maybe someday in the future. But so here I got transform reduce. I say the policy, got the input sequence, I have the re initial reduction value. And then I've got the binary reduction op here, the addition and then the uh, unary transform op here, squaring. And this is parallel vector norm with C17. All right. Stood file, the file system API. OK, so prior to C17, you had to use platform-specific APIs to access the file system. So here's what copying a file in a directory uh, looks like on Windows. Uh, there, oh, I should clarify, this is the code that Tony gave me. I, I, I don't know enough about Windows to, to know if this is right. I'm going to trust Tony on this, but like, I'm, I'm slightly terrified by like, they have like a copy file. Like, that's nice, but like, what is, what is going on here? I, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. So C17, we have a file system library that's pretty nice. It's, it's uh, based on Boost file system, and it's, it's, a, it's a portable way to access the file system. And I also think it has the benefit of having a pretty nice modern C++ API. So uh, it lives in file system. It does have the unfortunate long namespace. So you will frequently see people in examples or in code you do this namespace fs equals std colon colon file system. Everywhere I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to do that. It's based on boost file system, as I said. Uh, it, its interface is primarily non-member functions that operate on path objects and on, on other objects like directory iterators, but path is sort of the main vocabulary type of the file system API. So it's file system path, um, and, and as, as you can see here, you can do things like the slash operator to concatenate a directory, et cetera, and it handles all the differences between the file system structure on Windows and, and POSIX systems. And then uh, there's, uh, for working with directories, there's directory entries and then directory iterators. And then there's a whole bunch of metadata types like file set status uh, that, that sort of abstract away a platform-specific 
uh, uh, structures that have the same basic information. There's four major things you can do with the file system uh, interface. You can create paths and manipulate paths in a platform uh, uh, agnostic way. You can iterate directories and you can recurse through directories, so you can explore the directory structure. You can query file and directory metadata. And you can create, remove, uh, and uh, modify files and directories and modify their, their metadata. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a, a function to display the contents of a directory that we're in. Uh, on the, the left here is, is the like POSIX API implementation. And on the right here is the C++17 implementation where we're using directory iterators to go through it all. And then we're like querying the, the, the metadata status as we go. So I think it's a much nicer API. All right, so next up is polymorphic allocators and memory resources. So the old memory allocator model uh, can cause an explosion of instantiations of allocator-aware constructs with, with, with all these different allocator types here. So like I've, I've got, it's kind of unfortunate that if I'm going to use four different vectors with four different uh, 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 allocator types here that I need separate instantiations of all of vector for this. And then also, like, if I'm going to use like list two, then I need, or if I'm going to use like vector of double, uh, then I would need a, another instantiation of both my allocators and of my containers that I'm using the allocators with. It's kind of not great. So in C++17, we have a polymorphic allocator and a abstract interface called memory resource that lets us um, it's, it's basically a type erased allocator, uh, and then and then some some of the interface that the type erasure is uh, is done upon. So it's stood colon colon PMR. See see they were they were clever here. They picked the short namespace name. This was a good decision. So stood colon colon PMR colon colon allocator of int here, and same same thing. Like I, I can uh, do the same thing with my slab allocator here that I had here, and just pass it in. And now my my allocator doesn't need to necessarily know about the particular type, et cetera. So there's also a number, let me go here, yeah. So there's um, a number of standard memory resources, standard implementations of this interface. Um, so there's the std PMR new delete resource, that's the global new and delete. There's an unsynchronized pool resource, it's just a thread safe, a thread unsafe uh, memory pool. There's a thread safe memory pool. And then there's a monotonic buffer resource where the, the memory is only released when the resource goes out of scope. Um, so, so if you've seen any of John Lakos's talks about allocators, a lot of this is based on his work and in, in, in the, the, the allocator model that he's been uh, uh, pushing forward in the standard. Um, and so there's also these uh, aliases in the std colon colon PMR namespace for pretty much all the STL constructs that are allocator aware. What the aliases do is like std colon colon PMR colon colon vector is equivalent to this right here, just as a convenience. OK, uh, so aligned new. So prior to C++17, uh, you could rely on new giving you properly aligned memory below a certain threshold. But if you needed uh, memory aligned to some large, larger size, cache line size, maybe like something even larger than that, like the size of a particular cache bank, uh, uh, or, or in fact some, some multiplier of a particular cache to avoid cache aliasing conflicts, all weird stuff I've had to do um, and regret, but it's a use case I would like to have supported. It, it wasn't really possible to do this in a standard uh, way Prior to C++17, you needed to drop down to a low-level API like the POSIX memoline. Uh, has anybody here used POSIX memoline other than me? Yeah, it's not it's not the not my favorite thing in the world. Yeah. So in C++17, uh, this just kind of works magically. What it does is it if if you you mark up your types with a line as, or you mark up your a particular value or a particular uh, uh, object with a line as, say you know. This is what I want to align to. And then when you new it, um, the new will call into this new operator new that is allocator aware. And I know I just said the word new a couple times there and probably bad choice of words. But we've added these n overloads of operator new and operator delete that take a std align val t, 
which is just some enum that, that indicates that it's an alignment value. And when you call new, there's a, this lookup uh, procedure that will uh, prefer, it'll prefer sort of being backwards compatible, but if, if you've asked, asked for alignment, it'll go and call the, uh, the global allocator, assuming you don't have some class-specific allocator that you've written. So the lookup is like this. Uh, allocations requiring an alignment that is not guaranteed by alignment unaware in global new. The lookup order is class specific uh, and alignment aware, then class specific and un alignment unaware, and then global alignment aware new. So, yeah. I haven't tried that one actually. Um, I think it should, but I'm not positive of the answer about that. Um, Isn't alignment put to the side if you, if you have a base class or a member of this alignment? Yeah, yeah. But, but I, uh, the, I think the question is like if you, if you had both the, the class and then the member had an alignment requirement, right. which is preferred. And I think the, the classes would be preferred. Um, and if they were not compatible alignments, um, then you might have trouble, but uh, uh, hmm. yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd have to get back to you on that. On that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm not sure the. I'm not positive about the answer to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, if so, sorry. Talk, talk me, talk me through that again. So if you use the the align up here instead of instead of the raw uh, C array, if you want to use the same uh, alignment but through a split vector. So if you if you if your person struct is marked with align as uh, correctly here, then within std vector using the the default std allocator, it's going to call. Uh, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure if it's guaranteed that it'll call uh, that it'll call uh, array new, um, but but no, I, I think it would have to. Yeah, um, it's not just gonna gonna call any other allocator. Yeah. So yeah. So yes, it would just work with with stood vector out of the box. Sorry, I just had to talk. I had to talk myself into it. Um, yeah. I mean that's that's part of the reason for the design. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that is that. It, Today, you do in many cases get like alignment will be respected. It's just that above a certain threshold on, on platforms, uh, you don't get that guarantee. And this only kicks in on those platforms and, and takes care of those cases. So don't, don't freak out and like think like all your code has been like unaligned up until now. You, you may have been fine, but there have been some corner cases where it's not, not worked out. Yes? This might be a separate question, but is align, alignment also put to the side of the allocator right now? Don't think so. Yeah, the question was, is alignment, uh, is alignment associated with the type of the allocator? Yeah, okay. In this case, there's no, yeah, no information about alignment for an allocator. Yeah, so, so allocators right now, uh, hmm. we don't, I don't think we have, uh, alignment aware allocators. We, right now, we only have alignment aware new and delete, and alignment aware you know class specific new and delete. Um, that could be a thing that we should we should probably have in the future, but I don't believe we have that right now. Yeah. Can you talk about the align delete thing. They have to match up, I assume, right? Um, I, I have never met an aligned memory al allocation API where you can't just call free, where like it needs to call a specific one. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. I the question is answered. So on Windows, if if you need to, you can't just call the um, uh, alignment unaware uh, 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 delete. You need to call into that specific API. Um, yeah. On on POSIX, you don't have to do that. So and that's where I do most of my stuff. All right. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some improvements to the associative container APIs. So before C++17, uh, when dealing with maps, when you want to, uh, uh, you know, you want to insert something into a map, uh, but there's a potential existing key 
and you want to, you know, you want to have very concrete uh, behavior that you get for what happens with the existing key, and you want to get back information uh, about whether the insertion failed or succeeded. It's not super easy to do this today. You like you within place, it gives you back the standard pair of iterator and bool for, for, with the bool indicating whether whether the operation succeeded or not. But if you're uh, doing it with just uh, operator bracket, you don't get back that iterator to where the, the to the where the element was uh, uh, found there, which you might want if you were like, hey, I, I like didn't insert as I wanted to. And so you have no way right here of no, you also have no way of knowing whether this this succeeded or not. You have no way of knowing whether a P was even moved from or not here, which is kind of troubling. So in C17, we've added some new uh, insertion operations to maps. So all four of the maps, map, multi-map, unordered map, unordered multi-map. So there's try in, a try in place, um, which will uh, uh, fail if uh, the insertion failed, and it will guarantee you that if, if you, this thing here that you tried to move in was not moved if the insertion failed. So whereas in place does not make such a guarantee. And it will give you back the same thing that in place gives you of an iterator, of a, of a pair of iterator and bool, bool indicating whether the operation was successful or not. And then there's this insert or assign, and uh, it will insert this thing, uh, and it'll, it'll overwrite um, the existing thing, and it will give you back uh, the pair iterator bool. All right, we also have uh, this, so, so there are these splicing and merging operations now in C17. So the coolest one is merge. All the associative containers have this. So if I have two maps, M0, M1, I'm going to say M0.merge, M1. Um, and so this is, this uh, will copy from M1 to M0. I think it does take it, or in this case it would, I believe it does take it by uh, R value ref as well so that you could uh, uh, just give M1 to M0 and then it would move the nodes out of M1 M to M0 instead of copying them over. Um, and this won't overwrite existing keys. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not, I have on my notes here to read you out the complexity guarantees and I, I don't think that that's a thing that I'm gonna do. I, I think if you want them, you can go look at them in my notes. Um, so there's also this node-based extraction and insertion interface. So like if I have this, this thing here where I want to take something from one map, move it into another map, but I want to change the key, what I can do is I can do this source.extract here, and it'll give me back this node type. So all the associative containers now have an embedded type def for a node type, and it, it meets some interface. I don't have a slide for that, I think, but you can go take a look at, look at it on CPP reference. And uh, then I get the node out of it, so that removes the node from, from this. And then I can go and like say, hey, I want to change the key of that node. And then I want to go and insert it into this other uh, uh, map, which is pretty cool. All right, we're going to actually end on time, which is amazing. Like, super psyched about that. All right, special uh, uh, math, special functions. So um, there was previously a separate international standard that contained uh, this collection of what are known as the special functions in mathematics. Um, they're basically very popular math functions is sort of the easiest way to describe them. Uh, the name is based on, uh, it depends on who you ask, but it, it, it goes back to a very old Fortran library called SpecFun from, from uh, uh, Netlib, um, from probably older than I am. Uh, but so there's all these functions. They're now going to be in the std namespace. Um, we basically just merged this separate uh, spec document that had them into C17. Um, and there's, there's all of these ones, and then there's overloads for um, controlling the return types. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into these too much. This is super specialized uh, area. They're based on, this uh, library is based on boost math, though. If you're familiar with boost math, you may be familiar with these. All right, two more features, then we're done. So C17 adds variable templates for all the type traits and meta functions in the standard library. So previously, like if you're using uh, is integral, you just read right stood is integral t, then you'd have to do colon colon value. So now you can just write stood is integral underscore v, and that is a variable template alias to this. Fairly straightforward. 
So this is what they, what they look like just for people who have traits of their own and want to write them yourselves. Uh, although I guess maybe you stick an inline before there. Uh, I'm not certain whether that would need to be, in, whether that's implicit or not. Yeah, I think you need to put an inline in front of there. Uh, and they're all mostly in type traits. Yeah. All right. So let's say that we wanted to write an all integral type trait. So it's a type trait that takes a parameter pack, and we want it to be true if all of the elements are integral and false otherwise. So this is something you, you might see, or you might see a pattern similar to this, maybe not in a trait, but just in Sphenae conditions, when you're, you've got some functions that work with uh, variadic parameter packs. Um, so you could, with C++17, do this with fold expressions. That is very cool. Um, but this is not lazy. So this will, the fold expression approach will instantiate uh, t colon colon value for every element of the pack. So it won't do short circuiting. And that's not desirable in a number of cases. So we have uh, these Boolean logic meta functions in C17. So std conjunction does the uh, equivalent of this here. And here's, here's the, the three that we have. We have conjunction, disjunction, and negation. Bool constant is just this alias we introduced because I couldn't get integral constant. So this isn't C17. The reason it's on this slide is because I couldn't get the, get the slide to fit otherwise. Um, so conjunction basically does the equivalent of this, but with short circuiting, et cetera, and et cetera for, for negation here too. So they're just lazily evaluated Boolean logic meta functions. Uh, they have the underscore T and underscore V uh, uh, aliases as well. All right, so this is all the things we talked about. I have a much larger table of all the things we didn't talk about, but I didn't have like time to throw it in here. But I will put it uh, in the slides uh, a little bit later um, that were on the link that I showed you guys before. So we are like, how close are we to ending on time? We? OK, I can take some questions. Do people have questions? Yeah. Um, the question was, do structured bindings nest? The answer is they do not right now, but we believe it is a, a area that we could uh, explore in the future. So we don't think there's anything that would prevent us from, from exploring that in the future. Yeah. Do you know what the motivation was for calling those things conjunction and disjunction? Uh, <laughs> because we couldn't use and. Um, like, we couldn't use, oops. Uh, yeah, like, like we, I don't know what the choice was, but I really want to find out who was responsible for it. I mean, but like there were better, there were better names. There were better names. It's a little too verbose. So yeah, the names are not great. <sighs> Any other questions? Yeah, back there. Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, OK, so the question was, can standard any be constructed from movable but non-copyable types? I don't think it can because of the type erasure. I think it has to be copyable, even, even if you don't use it. In the, like, even if you only move the any, I think that it's still going to instantiate the, code, the type erasure code that uh, will require copy construct, uh, constructability. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure it's a hard requirement on copyable, not uh, on, on, yeah, on, on copyable and that move copyable is not good enough. All right, any other questions? Yeah. So, okay, so the question, a const x per lambda, can you use the, I'm not. I'm not certain. I understand that that. Uh, I'm. I'm still. I'm not. I. I don't. I don't. So. So to pass to. Yeah, it's pass it as a function argument to another const x per function. Yeah. And 
Yes, and uh, the same is in English. It's, it's like that. And sometimes I want to speak it in French. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm still not sure that I that I that I understand uh, the, the use case, though. I'm sorry. Uh, that that. I think. I think what he's asking is if you do not give a name to the lambda. Yeah. Then is it probably just something from the I'm gonna. Okay. Is that is that is that sort of what you're getting at? That 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 if you're using it anonymously, how do you how do you mark it as const expert? Um, so I think I don't think you can mark the entire thing as const expert. In that case, you would only be able to mark the call operator as const expert. Um, that's yeah, that's an interesting. That may that may be a, a a weakness of the way the 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 syntax works right now. Um, I think it's totally sufficient for the call operator to be const expert in that case. When you, when you immediately invoke it and it's anonymous. Yeah, but yeah. But if you're, but what if you're pass? But okay, I, if he's saying if you're passing it into a function where like you're going to copy the func door, uh, that might not be great. Um, I think you should talk to Louis Dion about this. Um, that does seem like it's a problem. Um, yeah, it's not great. Um, yeah. Is there stuff that didn't make it into C plus <laughs> plus seventeen? <laughs> <laughs> you know, concepts, modules. What got pushed down the road? Um, I, I don't know that I can answer that question aside from saying, so the question was, is there stuff that didn't make it into C++17? Uh, the, the best answer is probably yes. Um, uh, uh, there is a lot of stuff, there's, there's multiple things that are in flight right now. Um, we have about six or seven TSs in flight right now. Uh, concepts uh, is in a TS, modules is heading to a TS, ranges is in PTTS. Networking is in PTDS, coroutines is in PTDS, executors is in very early stages of um, maybe being in a, a TS. Concurrency and parallelism are both about to do their next round of TS. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Um, we have a large quantity of things that are in, fl in flight right now. Um, and there's other things that are, that are, that are in flight but that are uh, not in a TS or that are just directly headed for for, for 20. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things coming up. I think 20 and 23 will um, probably land uh, some set of larger changes uh, that will have a broader impact. Um, I hesitate to comment too much as to future direction, though. Um, yeah. Is there stuff that was deprecated or is hotly yes. debated for deprecation? There's a lot, bunch of stuff was deprecated or removed in C++. So the question is, um, was there stuff that was deprecated or removed? Uh, and are we going to deprecate and remove more things in the future? Um, so there was a bunch of stuff that was deprecated or removed in C++ 17. I have a, a slide on that, but it's not in this deck. I'll put it in this deck when I upload it. Um, and I'm not going to do a good job of remembering off the top of my head what those things are. Um, as for whether we're going to continue to do that, um, we certainly are. And the rate at which we are willing to do that is a, um, a question of that comes up frequently on the committee. And uh, many people have many different answers. Um, I think like we're, we're talking about doing this stood two thing. Um, and th it means different things to different people. Uh, some people see it as a way to, um, to fix mistakes of the past without uh, uh, having to satisfy the requirements of those who have a very high bar for uh, backwards compatibility. And there's others who I think view stood to as not, not sort of a self-contained thing where we redo everything, but just as a, a necessity because of uh, the, basically the size of the overload resolution set of, uh, of standard algorithms and other constructs. Um, and there are viewpoints in the middle of that, of course. All right, I think one or two more questions, then we're going to wrap it up. Yeah. For the execution policy from the parallel algorithm, is there a policy which only allows virtualization but no parallelism? Yeah, well, it's a, stood on seek. Yeah, that's an interesting story. It would have been really nice if we could have had that in. Um, <laughs> like, I really wanted that, but. 
Yeah, oh, sorry. The question was, why don't we have a policy that just does vectorization, a, an ex a parallel execution policy that just does ex vectorization? Why is there only std par that requests both parallelization and vectorization? Um, there, there's no good excuse for this. Um, uh, I came into the process at a stage where it was probably too late to. So I, I've been working on, on, on parallel algorithm stuff for like the past year and a half. And uh, at that point, the parallelism TS had these three execution policies, and it was unlikely we were going to be able to add an additional one uh, uh, when we merged it in. Um, it, it is really unfortunate, because um, like that's my like primary use case. Like I don't want to like I don't I barely write parallel code. I just like write vector code. That's all I do. So yeah, sorry, it'll be coming. Yeah, one more question, last one. Yeah. Um, so the question was, how, do, how, how, would you, what, how does the parallel algorithms work? Does it spawn threads? What does it do? Um, the answer is, it is sort of a task-based system. Um, the best way to think about it is to think about it in terms of executors, to imagine that there is some implicit uh, global uh, executor. And what an executor does is an executor is a thing that creates work items, so tasks. And that is, like, that is the degree to which it is specified what an executor does. One way that you could implement an executor is by spawning threats. Um, I suspect that it is unlikely that any standard library will implement the parallel algorithms by spawning up individual threads for each task every time you call the parallel algorithms. Um, but there's a wide range of options here. And the reason why this is such a, why you get such a vague answer to this question is because this is a facility that's designed to work on a very wide range of hardware with a very wide range of options for parallelism. Uh, so this is designed to work on GPUs and CPUs and other types of accelerators as well. All right, last question, I swear. Uh, so yeah. Um, well, uh, so the, the question is, um, why don't we have like more customized pot policies for specific, uh, specific t models? Um, so right now we don't, like right now I think we imagine that there might be vendor specified policies and we've left, we've gone out of our way to leave the door to make sure we don't bake in anything um, that, uh, anything too specific to uh, the execution policies, so like like all the all, all the error handling differences, all, all the differences, everything is like said like it's for these execution policies, and otherwise it's implementation defined. So there's room for implementations to extend it. Um, for users to extend it is a different. For users to write their own execution policies is a different story. And right now there's no interface for what an execution policy is. Um, and in fact, what an execution policy is is not an easy question to answer. Um, uh, Executors are the thing that are sort of designed to, uh, to be customized by users. But I, I posit that executors do not, that executors and execution policies are and should remain separate things. That an, an execution policy describes restrictions, and it would be nice in the future if we had a way of writing those ourselves, but I can't imagine how we would do that. Uh, because like they have, they, there are specific forward progress guarantee language in the standard for those execution policies. And I'm not sure how to, like, I'm not sure how to create an interface where you could write, like, um, what forward, pro what, what progress guarantees are made by, like, what progress guarantees you're looking for specifically. Uh, I think that would be difficult. But maybe in the future. All right, thank you all.